Welcome to the BioBalance HealthCast, episode number 324, continuing conversation on thoughts of changing the healthcare system. BioBalance HealthCast features conversations about positive aging. Your hosts are Dr. Kathy Maupin, Medical Director of BioBalance Health and a leading expert in treating symptoms of aging, and Brett Newcomb, a licensed professional counselor. Dr. Maupin and Brett are the authors of The Secret Female Hormone, the seminal work about hormone replacement therapy for women, which is available on Amazon or from Dr. Maupin's office at BioBalance Health. Dr. Maupin's office is currently accepting new patients. Welcome to the BioBalance HealthCast. We are continuing conversation this week that we started in our previous HealthCast about discussions that are going on in the United States now, in the United States government, the Congress, about Obamacare and the healthcare system in general in an effort to understand how it works and where, if anywhere, changes should be made. And there's a lot of data that's going to be coming out uh, comparing our healthcare system to systems around the world, our life expectancy, uh, where the best things are treated best around the world, and what works for for us. I mean, how we're going to solve this problem. So Dr. Moffin and I have been co- having this conversation among ourselves and among other physicians that we know. Mm-hmm. And we've come up with a couple of suggestions that we would like for people to hear and consider uh, as they pay attention to this conversation. Mm-hmm. And, and Kathy, you have two alternative views of ways to impact change. Two choices. Two choices. Two choices. You, you and if you go down, down one path two choices. or the other path, but you can't really Straddle. merge these two. Yeah. Okay. So the first choice that you would suggest that we would consider uh, has a buzzword that a lot of people are offended by immediately, mm-hmm. but it's a buzzword. Listen to the concept. Listen to the point that's being made and see if that, if, if you get outside of the semantics that, that might have passion behind them. Is there anything there that has legs? Mm-hmm. And that is, you would suggest that we should establish a universal, universal health care without the insurance companies being involved at all. Right. So what does that mean exactly? When you say that, because those mm-hmm. terms are okay. laden terms. Right. So I, I, how do we get to the point that you're making? So universal health care is paid for by the government, okay. right? We know that. So it's paid for with your tax dollars. And it is available to everyone. We have two systems right now, Medicare and Medicaid, that are that are universal for older well, Americans and Americans. poor Americans. Yeah. But but and I'm not saying anything about taking away those, but adding a a universal care for other people who don't get or for everyone else, actually. Right. Okay. So everyone would get it would some a basic type level of, care. of care for everybody in right. the United States. Right. And it would but the problem with healthcare right now is and the and the cost of it is that insurance companies keep ratcheting up the price of the insurance, which all that means is that you put money in and they're a bank and they decide if they're gonna give it to you or not. Right. Basically you can have this treatment or you can have that treatment. They decide on your health care by limiting your health care. And that's how they make huge profits. So if you take that part out and you have it administrated by the government or a different form of administration of payment, but it's directly with hospitals, directly with doctors, mm-hmm. instead of having this huge amount of money just being thrown into stocks, and into bonuses for insurance companies and paying this huge machine, then we would have enough money to fund this the rest of the coverage by paying directly to doctors and hospitals. When we were discussing this and you were explaining to me your thoughts about it, one of the things that you shared was that you thought if we went to a universal system where our tax dollars go into a fund to pay for medical care for everybody, Mm -hmm. and then obviously somebody somewhere has to make decisions about uh, who gets what care. Mm-hmm. You know, I remember Sarah Palin and the mm-hmm. death panels. Uh, what is appropriate care? What's the best care? But you were saying... A, a, <laughs> Where did that come from? <laughs> well, because somebody I has mean, to make those decisions. Is it going to be this committee of citizens, politicians, what have you, or is it going to be physicians? 
That's who good. make the decisions. Mm -hmm. And so then that leads to the point that I was mm -hmm. going to get to. You said if, if it's going to be physicians making medical decisions, mm -hmm. where are we going to get the doctors? If, and your suggestion is that if we move to a universal healthcare system, that the cost of education for physicians should be paid for by the government. Right, by, and, by then, the and then we wouldn't have to pay doctors quite as much. And, and then we could, because they wouldn't have a half million dollar investment that they put out personally to get to the point where they could be doctors. Right. That yes. cost would be absorbed by the system. Mm -hmm. And then they could come out and say, here I am, I'm ready, I want to practice medicine. And then the government could determine an appropriate salary for mm -hmm. them. Mm -hmm. Or how much they work, because if you have a salary, you have to work a number of hours to get that salary. How many and hours appropriate a week? Hours of week. And you get paid per hour, per right. procedure, what have you. How does that compare to other systems? And you're thinking, I mean, uh -huh. obviously it doesn't exist right now, uh -huh. but if to other systems that have countries uh, that have universal health care, like England, uh, England, they have universal health care, but they also have for those that are able and willing to pay mm -hmm. uh, boutique services at mm -hmm. systems or clinics that operate outside of universal health care. Right. So if I am in the system and I have a heart condition, I can go to the hospital and the doctors within mm -hmm. the system. Mm -hmm. Or if there's somebody I know of who's a heart specialist that I can pay cash to, if I mm -hmm. have the cash, then I can go see them as well and right. receive treatment. So that happens. That happens in Would England. Would you suggest the same? I, I think, I don't suggest it, but I think that that's what's going to happen. It would evolve that way. It would evolve that way because Americans are used to having choice. Right. Used to deciding on what they want to spend their money on. Do they want a car? Do they want health? Do I, you know, I mean, yeah. seriously, they, right. they have disposable income. They want to decide. They don't want to have somebody just say, this is all you can have. Right. But... Universal health care would mean that when you go to the hospital, you don't have to fill out all this stuff. They don't have to do a wallet biopsy. You would just be taken care of. Right. So may, in general, the hospitals, the emergency rooms, the extraordinary care would be just paid for by, paid for by tax dollars. But, but I'm not saying that you don't need someone to distribute the money mm -hmm. like a bank would or like a company would. But you don't need somebody, a, a company that is traded on the stock exchange, making money and making and going for profits to do that. We need the profit from all the insurance, medical insurance, to actually be put into the system to pay for lots of stuff that we actually right. need. Right. So there is there is going to need to be a company or a service or a group of people who distribute the money for healthcare. But it doesn't need to be a profit. Right. kind of system. So a government agency, just like Medicare right. now, mm -hmm. or Medicaid now. They, but they use insurance companies too. So they would have to use just... Well, they make the decisions on the front end, and then they tell the insurance companies, mm -hmm. this is what you pay for this and that to whomever. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. So that was one suggestion mm -hmm. that you made. If we're really going to shake the system up and see, can we, can we get a better result than we have? If we put everything on the table, all the component parts... Mm -hmm. One way to do it is to move to a universal health care. So and you get one of, thing, you give one thing. A, what, lot of, you know? a lot of people are considering that and talking about that mm -hmm. as an option to go forward. Another option that you are suggesting, if they, people are not willing to take a universal health care mm -hmm. system, is that we reconstruct medical care and insurance, controlling the profits of the insurance companies. Mm -hmm. What do you mean by that when you say that? Or the doctors that you've talked to that, that say that? What does that mean exactly? Well, we've watched the insurance companies go between patient and doctor alternate and take a little like from a the shell patient. Game. A shell game. It was a shell game. It was it was increase increase the uh, deductible for one year, just a little bit. Decrease what they paid the doctors another year, a little bit. Increase the uh, co-pays one year. Then so, and so, they kept increasing the amount of money that they used as profit. So I worked for school districts and universities mm -hmm. much of my life, and we would have annual meetings where they would explain benefits mm -hmm. for the next year. Here's your mm -hmm. salary. Here's your retirement. Pay, here's whatever. But part of the benefit package would be the health care package. Mm -hmm. And usually we, we'd have like one or two or three uh, ABC options. Mm -hmm. You choose this set, this set, or this mm -hmm. set. And you can buy individual coverage just for me if my wife has a job and mm -hmm. she's got insurance. Or you can buy family coverage. Mm -hmm one child, three children, mm -hmm. the whole ball of wax. Uh, 
So each of those has different amounts of coverage mm -hmm. and different co-pays mm -hmm. and different requirements on whether or not different I have to get pre-approval, different deductibles. Mm -hmm. So every year that seemed to go up. It does you go know, up. You know, the copay would go up. To see a doctor last year cost me ten dollars for an office visit. This year it cost fifteen. To see a specialist last year it cost thirty. This year it cost fifty. Mm -hmm. uh, so that so that's more money in so I'm saying, their oh pocket. Gosh, but what happens is the doctors aren't getting that. Well, but that was the assumption I made. But that's the Dang assumption you made. Raising, you no, know. the doctors are making less because then the contract they give us they pay us less. So the middleman is making all the money. So all the money staying in the right. middle. And and being siphoned out as corporate profit, right? And uh, and they're and and trading trading um, stock on it. I mean, it's actually a, a traded. Yeah, they're traded companies. I mean, you have to <laughs> you have to have a lot of profit to to be a publicly traded company, and they're giving their dividends and stuff to the people who buy stock. It right. doesn't. So it's it, about the dividend. It. I mean, that is not something that should be publicly traded. I mean, medical insurance should be medical insurance or a medical payment system with a minimal profit, but not a public company. It is taking all the money out of healthcare, and they're not controlled so, at all. They so can do whatever they want. Your suggestion would be that if the government, the Congress, and the president are going to redesign the system, that they look at taking some of the capitalistic leverage out of it. Mm -hmm and put the decision-making back in the hands of the people that provide the services. Right. I mean, doesn't that make sense? <coughs> it does to me. Because it's medicine is because a one-on-one -on -one deal, you the, and your doctor. The desired end goal is better medical care, right. not more profit. And if a doctor wants to spend an hour with you and not lose money. Or, or needs to. Or needs to spend an hour with you because you, need, you have lots of problems, right. then they shouldn't be losing money because they spend more time with you. Right. But they're I mean, but that's what they're, they're penalized to spend more time. Right. When they say that Medicare has this, oh, you're such a good doctor program, that means that you see more patients in an hour than anybody else. That means you're not a better doctor. Does it work? It means that you get, you get money from the government if you can see more patients in an hour than somebody else. Does it work the same way in surgeries? Like, if, if, you know, they put out a formula, the average knee replacement surgery should take 47 minutes. They don't do the time. They don't have time in the operating room like that. They just control it by money. Right. So it's to, to us, they don't control the doctors that see people in the office by time. It's just that that's the amount of, you can, you have your time honed down depending on what the doctor needs in terms of overhead to pay the bills. And so there's always a cost benefit ratio. Right. But in surgery, what they do is they say, we have too many hysterectomies. We're paying too much money for hysterectomies. So it's not just the doctor they pay. They pay the hospital. They pay the operating room, anesthesia. So there's separate bills for all of this if you go in for a surgery. So what they did was, who controls whether you get a his, whether I get a hysterectomy or not? Well, the doctor does. Well, the doctor, if we pay the doctor so much less for that procedure that it costs them money to go to the operating room, they won't do it anymore. Okay. Well, that's what's happened. So they pay go down. hysterectomies in 1985 for six weeks of care, pre and post op, operating room, everything for the doctor was thirty six hundred dollars. Now it is six hundred dollars. Six hundred dollars. That's not enough to. That's not enough to pay your malpractice insurance for that procedure and pay your staff at the office, much less pay yourself. So doctors don't do them anymore. <laughs> they give you medicine. They, they the try same, a million things. They do the same that thing in my don't industry. work in my industry. The, we have to give a diagnostic code for mm -hmm. counseling. And so there used to be a diagnostic code that said parent-child problem. Right. And it was a, what was called a V code. And we could use that, and insurance companies would pay for it. Mm -hmm. And then every four years, they revised the DSM. And so they looked at all the data, and they said, there are two doggone many parent-child problems. Right. We're not going to cover that anymore. We're going to take that whole label out and throw it they away. They took the code out. Took the code away. You couldn't use it. They won't pay you for it. You have to have it. a Doesn't code. Exist. For a, per, per, for a particular problem to get paid for. So then to we, get paid. we had to figure out, okay, if we're going to see these people for this issue, how can we Code ethically it. and legitimately put a label on it? So we moved to a different label. It's just a and shell game. The whole thing out. is a <laughs> shell game. None of this stuff makes sense medically. Yeah. None of it makes sense. They took away... Um, one, of the, one of the codes for, oh, testicular... Um, 
uh, like andropause, when the testicles quit working for some right. reason, right. they took that code out. Yeah. We have a so, whole new coding system. So by definition, your testicles are all working now. Yeah, because you, you can't no code it. I can't treat somebody for testicular failure because there's no code for it. Okay, so you That have, makes no sense. <laughs> there's so many people in this pie. You need to get them out. I mean, yeah, honestly. Exactly. And, and part of, and sadly, part of the people determining the codes is the government. So what, the things that we thought if, might If you take help. either of these alternatives that we're suggesting, one, limit the control of the insurance companies, one, go to universal care. There are 11 other suggestions that Dr. Moffin uh, wants to discuss. So, so, so one of the things was um, medical insurance would no longer be associated with employment. So you would, you could, it's still tax deductible, but you would be able to choose your medical insurance like you choose your car insurance. So it'd be portability. I, I, over my or, career, I've known a number of people that couldn't afford to quit a job because they had established coverage with established benefits. And if they changed insurance companies, then those issues that they had would be pre-existing conditions mm -hmm. that would be exempted from the new insurance. So they couldn't afford, if they had a sick child, they couldn't change jobs. But were, Obamacare got rid of pre-existing. It, it was, did. And that was one of the good things that it did. Yes. And that should remain. Yes. But you should be able to buy your own insurance and buy what you want, not what your employer wants. Because when we put the employer between, between the patient and, and the, the doctor, right. then then really you are you are you are not able to actually negotiate or get what you need because there's this big buffer in between. To me, it's like when you buy a car and then and you finance it through GM and then GM sells the, the loan, to the loan else. then there's no one to go to. Right. I mean, it's it's just a manipulation of money money managers. Well, and we had the same conversation about state regulations, the state regulation of the insurance company. Your insurance company has to be legitimized by your state legislature mm -hmm. for them to offer their services in your state. Same mm -hmm. thing with a physician. And, and one of the things that technology is allowing is if you're my physician and you move to Phoenix, you could still see me via Skype or uh -huh. any, any number of systems. But legally, you can't practice medicine in unless you in, have a, yeah, a license in, in both states. Uh -huh. uh, same thing with insurance companies. Uh -huh. So all of that uh, intrastate, interstate conflict needs to be resolved in favor of the citizen being able to make the choice. Citizens make the choice, and then there's more competition between the insurance companies, and they don't. They have to make you happy. They don't don't just have to make your employer happy, okay. which I think is really important. Um, I also think that one of the things that Obamacare did that was good but not enough was that they gave you one more year on your children living at home, mm -hmm. because children tend to have a in the U.S. have an extended adolescence. So anybody who's living at home and doesn't file their taxes separately from their parents should be allowed to stay on family insurance. The average age now at which children become completely autonomous and independent is 27. I thought it was 80. So, so they, <laughs> they let you now keep them until 26 as long uh, on your insurance if they need to be, mm -hmm. if you need them to be. So, so you would continue that? I would continue that and make it older. <laughs> I mean, if you know, they live at home, if they live at home and don't yeah. file separately. Okay. So then, then the other thing that we've been dealing with is drug companies have increased and pharmacies have increased the price of all the drugs out there this year astronomically. And I don't know what that's about, but patients have come in and a cheap and cheap generic drug has been very expensive now. So we don't, they can do whatever they want. There's no regulation on that. There should be, there should be, um, a, Central for especially for Medicare and Medicaid, a central buying co-op that the government uses buys the you know does well. Its right now, thing the law forbids them to to uh, negotiate prices with drug companies. They just why? have to whatever the, they negotiate because prices the politicians with us. set it up that way. <laughs> and so you're saying the politicians can change it and should change. Right, it. they should. They yeah. should actually make it so that. There are reasonable costs for drugs and right. a reasonable amount for R and D, and maybe even extend extend the um, extend the patent so that you can spread your costs over a longer period of time. Well, and right now they're they're they've got the telescope turned around. If you need a certain drug and your insurance company won't pay for it, 
and it costs more than you can afford, you can go to other countries and get the same exact drug made by the same manufacturer to the same stringent requirements. You can go to Canada, for instance, mm -hmm. and buy this drug, or Mexico and buy this mm -hmm. drug cheaper, mm -hmm. but the government restricts your ability to do that. Mm -hmm. You can't get it through the mail. You shouldn't order it online. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's technically yeah. illegal. Uh, but people that live within like 200 miles of the Canadian border, mm -hmm. they actually have buses that take old people into Canada to, to the get drugs. their medicine and bring them home. Nobody's stopping the buses. Nobody's stopping back. the buses, but you can't order it in the mail. Right. Uh, but so there are people do, but they're not supposed do, to. And doctors, it's against the law for doctors to exactly. order any drug like that they need. Like if I could get a drug that I could inject in my office, something I would use or they would use in surgery. Or right. I think it was infertility drugs that are so expensive here, but the same company sells them in Mexico and they're cheap. Yeah. So it's it's against the law for a doctor to, to bring that in. They so, go but, to jail. but you, could you tell me you need to go to Mexico and get this drug, and it's actually worth the trip? I I can tell you that because they don't know what I said in my my conference okay. with you. And then, so I can go there and get it and bring it back and, mm -hmm. and bring it to you, and you can use it. Maybe I can't use it. You can't use it. You can use it. I can use it. You'd have to so inject it those, yourself. Yeah, exactly. So all those requirements need to be revisited and changed. Because there's no competition. Right. I mean, there's no competition well, for the pharmacy, pharmaceutical they, they've companies. They've got you locked up. To, yeah. you, you are owned by the insurance companies and the drug companies. So people's, people want us to pre-certify things. That, that's the other way they control it. They say, right. the doctor has to pre-certify this drug. Well, the doctor doesn't have time to sit on the phone with high school people on the other end to pre-certify a drug that's going to save you $15 because that would cost me $50 of my time or $100 of my time to do that. So so that's a way they get you not to get a drug. So we're going to run out of time before we cover all 11 of these items. <laughs> I want to make you aware that if you look at our website, mm -hmm. the, these are all listed on our blog that accompanies the HealthCast and you can see them. Uh, and we'll post a list of them as well. But there's a couple more that I want to make sure that we, we talk about. Uh, one of the suggestions that you wanted to make, if, if they're going to make any revision in the system, is they change the law that regulates emergency room treatment. Right. Can you talk to that specifically? So, so what's happened is many, emer so how this affects the uh, patient is, I mean, many emergency rooms have closed all over the country because they are losing money fast because they there was a law, I don't know what year, that... Um, federal law that said that it's called MTALA, and it says that anybody who comes to your emergency room cannot be sent out of the emergency room, cannot be turned away. They have to be treated. So people who don't don't have insurance, don't feel like using their Medicaid, Medicare, going to their doctor, just it's convenient because they're open 24 hours, go to the ER for everything. And what that ER care is expensive. And the insurance or the hospitals aren't getting paid for that in general uh, for many people. And then Medicare and Medicaid pay very little. They pay what they pay in an office visit. So they can't afford to stay open unless they've got enough real emergencies and enough real care. I mean, they have to staff it for all these people that come in for earaches and crying babies. This, this is, this is a rule that has ruined health, uh, emergency room care. I was talking to a woman this week. She's uh, unemployed. She's on unemployment insurance. She's on WIC. She's on food stamps. She's on all these social support systems. Oh, yeah, she has federal. a two, two year old baby, and the baby needed checkups and shots. Mm -hmm. So she called the baby's doctor and made an appointment. The day of the appointment, it was inconvenient for her to take the baby. So she didn't cancel the appointment, but she didn't show up. And then instead, she took the baby to the emergency room. So the cost to the system to was, cover her decision-making and treat her child was financially enormous. Well, the doctor didn't get paid. It's not the system. It's just the doctor didn't get paid. So they well, are But also the, the hospital that the provides hospital. the ER right. that facility, was, that, that was cost the worst part. them. Uh, yeah. And they couldn't turn her away and say, you need to go to the doctor's office. Exactly. They figured this out. Right. So so that the whole emergency room That's, structure thing needs to be It's also ruined the emergency rooms in our border states. The our southern border that take in a lot of illegals because they have to treat illegals like citizens. Even though they're not, they have to take them in and for their babies to be delivered or whatever. They do all the medical care for northern Mexico. Right. So they end up closing right. or end up being so busy that people with real emergency emergencies can't get in. 
or people that are paying the taxes for the system to operate right. can't access the services. Or they can't afford the taxes. Yeah. The taxes keep going up. Okay. So so this is, it's a huge problem. It was a one, it sounded good in the beginning. Oh, we're going to take care of everybody, but you right. can't do that in a in a non-universal health care system. But another suggestion you make about revising emergency systems is creating sort of like scale, have a public health clinic mm -hmm. in a facility where there's an emergency room. Right. And then being able to do triage to say, this is not an emergent condition, go next door. But that ends up being expensive because you have to stay open 24-7 because right. everybody figures out you're closed at 5, I'm coming to the ER, it'll be faster. Right, right, exactly. So, so, so they have to look at mm -hmm. that. Uh, then you, su you suggest that we change the laws about being able to buy medicines overseas, both for doctors and patients. Right. Uh, if, if that's a better price mm -hmm. for the product, for mm -hmm. the same product. For the same product. Yeah. Uh, you looked, You talked about government uh, central purchasing. Uh, decrease the requirements for CLIA and HIPAA. W HIPAA what? costs us so much money. Every six months they change the laws of privacy, which is it's almost a joke because it seems like they're doing it just, just to tool the doctors around so it costs us more money. Right. But every time they change the law, it costs doctors money in training and setting up their offices. And honestly, it's, it's kind of a false security because your insurance company has everything on you. And the government pretty much has everything on you. So if you think that you have privacy for your medical records, you really don't. Well, and they, they I mean, they, for people that don't know, they literally come in and tell you, you need to put a window in this wall that slides shut so that nobody can see your computer. Or you need to buy a curved uh, thing to go on the side of your computer so that somebody standing on the other side of the counter can't, can't see, see a patient's it. name or diagnostic code or bill on your computer. But you have to have your computer that'll pull it up. Well, what's funny is they have a sign-in sheet that's on a, a paper clip that's on the other side of the counter where you can see everybody's name that's in the office. Right. They, <laughs> they used to say you couldn't have that, and they changed the yeah. law because everybody protested. The doctors protested because they couldn't tell who they were calling into the room. They'd say, that first they'd say, you could have the first name, but not the last name. Right. Well, you call John, you get the wrong John. Right. And so then, then, but you're sitting there in the same room looking at each other. Right. So, I mean, if you want to know if somebody's going to the doctor, you just have to sit outside or you have to just be in the waiting room and see if somebody's going to the doctor. That's not, right. we can't protect ourselves from that. No, you can't. And, and, and that's not something you should have to protect and yourself. What the public may not know is that the HIPAA requirements are onerous, intrusive micromanagement uh, in the guise of providing better privacy for you. And it costs a lot of money. It costs a lot of money. And they and the the company that supplies most of the medical software has a huge lobbying group in DC who makes people think they're doing something good by changing the rules every time, right. and they're making money every time they're changed. At any rate, it, it is a complex problem. We could go is, on for hours. We we have, and obviously we will <laughs> some more. Uh, but hopefully, some of the things that we have mentioned today will get you interested and help you track and understand what you're reading in the media uh, or seeing in the media, and maybe even interested to the point that you would contact your representatives to say, this needs to be looked at. This needs to be changed in these ways. And don't just suffer passively while the system determines what happens to you medically. Get involved. Thank you. Email your questions or comments to podcast at biobalancehealth.com. You can find the Biobalance HealthCast on iTunes and on YouTube. For more information about bioidentical hormone pellet therapy and other reverse aging solutions, visit biobalancehealth.com or call 314-993-0963. You can find Dr. Maupin on Twitter at Dr. Kathy Maupin and on Facebook at facebook.com slash biobalancehealth. Find Brett Newcomb at brettnewcomb.com.